Hey everyone, this is Kenny from Todd Tutoring. Today I'll be going over the first 10 questions on a basic walkthrough of the ACT math section. If you haven't seen my video before, this will be using the exact same strategy I explained below. I would highly recommend you check it out. The link will be in the description. But for now, we'll be going over the first 10 questions of the ACT math section that's released every year in their practice exam. First, I want to take a note of the directions. It says solve each problem, choose the correct answer, then fill in the corresponding oval on your answer document. So that basically means that it will be, you'll have one question, one answer for every question. There's one correct answer. Do not linger over any problems that take too much time. Obviously, go back to it. The big thing here is that you are permitted to use the calculator. So a lot of these things I'll have here, I won't have a calculator pulled up, but I will definitely reference just use a calculator because these calculations can just be made super easy, easily with a calculator rather than doing it on your head. Um, but some problems may be done without using calculator. That's obviously obvious. Obvious in this case, you know, it's two plus three. You don't need to use a calculator to not. So I stated they kind of really are pretty accurate. So I would not um, excuse that too much. That it's not drawn to scale. Geometric figures lie in a plane. That's obviously the word line. All right, so let's move on to question one first. So one says the numbers one through 15 were written on individual pieces of paper, one number per piece. Then the 15 pieces of paper were put in a jar. One piece of paper will be drawn from the jar at random. What is the probability of drawing a piece of paper with a number less than nine written on it? Okay, so first let's kind of go for the first thing, which is what is the question asking? It is asking for the probability that you draw a number that is less than nine. So just what's the probability of drawing a number less than nine? All right, what information do they give us? That we know that there is numbers one through 15. So there's 15 pieces of paper and one per piece, really simple. And then you want something less than nine. So, okay, how many ones would be less than nine? Well, that's one through eight. So that's one through eight is less than nine. And so then the probability, remember, is the probability of selecting something over the total amount of outcomes. So that's, let's go to step three, doing the math. So that's basically the probability is your wanted events over total. And so basically you would get eight out of 15. Now let's check, we see that's E. Does that make relative sense? Yeah, I would say so, because there's about half that's about less than nine and that's a great answer there. Perfect. So we move on and we are done with number one. Question two, which of the following expressions is equivalent to negative four X cubed minus 12 X cubed plus nine X squared. This is fairly straightforward, not too much wording here and just which one's equivalent. And if you're ever stuck on these things, I would just look at the answer choices and see what's going on. And it looks like I just have to simplify this expression. So really it's just, really this could just be down to simplifying. So that'd be one, just simplify the expression. And then number two, uh, they give us what information they give us. They basically give us the expression that's not simplified. And then doing the math, we see that negative four X cubed and negative 12 X cubed can be simplified together. And so that's negative four minus 12. Now, if they have the same powers, you can bring them together. And in this case they do. And then you just combine the coefficients of so minus four and minus 12 would get us negative 16 X cubed. And then the next nine x squared goes alone because it's not the same power so plus nine x squared. See, so we have that there. And here we go. We have j. And that makes relative sense. We know the cubes should go together, but we should still have nine x squared. J is going to be a perfect answer. And we can move on with our day. So question three, when it says when x equals two, what is 10 plus three times 12 divided by three times x? And this really just looks like PEMDAS, but let's not move up too fast. Number one, it has basically evaluate the expression, evaluate the equation, I should say. And what's the problem information they give us? They give us an x equals two. So that would kind of help us solve the problem. What is this whole expression thing equal to? And so we just got to plug that in and then do PEMDAS. So we writing that in for doing the math, I'd have 10 plus three parentheses, 12 divided by, and then now we have three times two. I'm having a dot because I don't want to confuse you with the x in there. And so remember, do parentheses first. So the innermost thing would be this three times two. So that's equal to six 
10 plus 3 times 12 divided by 6. Right. And so from there, next thing in parentheses would be 12 divided by 6. So I'm just going to carry up here. That's equal to 2. So 10 plus 3 times 2. And then you multiply 3 times 2. That's equal to 6. So I get 10 plus 6. And that's going to equal to 16. I see that. Good. I'm going to quickly check over. That looks like I did everything correct. And then we can move on. Question four. So it looks, looks like another e. Just evaluate. That's what they give us. And I'm just going to take no absolute values. Remember that anything inside for the final result is going to be positive version of it. And so I'm going to do the math now. So I'm going to do four minus three or five. So that's going to be equal to the absolute value of two minus the absolute value of negative five. And then that's just going to be two minus five because that's going to be positive. And then that's just equal to negative three. Seems about right. Checking over, doing it right. That's going to match with G. Perfect. And we're on our way to question five. Question five, another expression says the expression parentheses 4c minus 3d times the quantity of 3c plus d is equivalent to what? And I'm looking at this and immediately at one, it's just simplifying or FOIL, expand. But really it's going to spring back to my FOIL days of first, outer, inner, last. So kind of drawing that in, first times your outer, times your inner, times your last. So let's do that. 4c times 3c is going to get me 12c squared. And then outer, 4c times d is just plus 4cd. The negative 3d times 3c is going to get me negative 9cd. And negative 3 times d is going to be minus 3d squared. Now, we'll look at this. I'm not done because I see four things and the answer thing only has three. Sometimes I like to interplay of doing checking my work with the answers while I'm doing it, but that sometimes can be a pitfall because you'll see your, like an answer that you're not done with and you'll circle it, so just be careful. But in this case, every time you FOIL, usually for the most part, you'll see things that can be combined. In this case, it's the four CDs. So four minus nine is gonna get you negative five. So I'm gonna get 12 C squared minus five CD minus three D squared. And that's gonna match answer C. Makes sense, checks out, I'm gonna be okay. If you're unconfident, which is sometimes, going to happen later and so hopefully not in the beginning but you can always go back and just check your work checking back looks fine to me and perfect we're going to move on question six um states of the 180 students in the college course one fourth of the students earned an a for the course one third of the students earned a b for the course and the rest earned c's how many students earned c's for the course so this is a classic problem just testing your fractions you can do this in multiple ways. I'm going to show the way that I usually do it in a couple in another different way as well. For this first part, though, we have to think about what is the question asking. And it's asking how many students earned a C. So then that's what we're looking for. How many students earned a C? And then what information do they give us? Well, we know that there are 180 students. One fourth of them earned an A. That's important. One third is the B. But you notice that what the other students get is not important because you're really focusing on how many earned a C and they say the rest earned a C. So for me, I want to figure out what that rest is. And so to do so, I know that there would be a hundred, like if I have a fraction, there's one of the students, like a hundred percent. And so then the ones that earn C's would be one, take away a fourth of the pi, right? And take away a third of the pi. And what do you get? And so there's a couple ways to do this. You can use a calculator if you want to do, do that really quickly. Um, you can with fractions, do that in your head as well. Um, either way, there's a couple, or you can just convert them to decimals because you should know 0 0.25 and 0 0.33 and you get a, an approximate answer. For me, I'm just going to kind of show you how to do this by hand real quick because I'm decent with fractions. And so you can say one is minus one and three twelfths. I'm just convert that minus four twelfths. And so this can be really 12 or 12 as well as one and so you're going to get five twelfths left over five twelfths you could have done that with a calculator and then that's the fraction right this is the fraction of students that didn't that got a c and so you'd have to multiply that by the numbers so then you take five twelfths 
times 180, right? And using a calculator to do so, you can get, just pulling it up here. Here, I probably could have done it faster just using my, by hand, but you should get 75 students. And that makes about sense because a third plus a fourth will get you more than half. So you're expecting around a little less than a half to earn a C in the course. And so F would be your answer, and that makes sense. Now I'll show you another way how to do this one, just so, because there's more than one way to skin a cat, is that you just think of, well, how many students got an A first, how many students got a B, and then take that away from 180, rather than doing the fraction way. So in that case, I would take the ones that got A's would be one fourth times 180, which would be, just make sure 45. And then the B's would be one third of 180, which is 60. And then take that away from 180 to get the C's minus 45 minus 60. And you'll end up with the same 75 students do it either way. Just both ways how to do it. Just showing you that there's multiple ways to kind of go about a problem, which everyone fits your learning style and thinking way best, especially when you're, this is time constraint. You want to go with what you know best. All right. Question seven, the number of fish F in Skipper's Pond at the beginning of each year can be modeled by the equation. F of X is equal to three times two to the power of X, where X resembles the number of years after the beginning at the beginning of the year of 2000. For example, X equals zero begins the beginning year 2000, X equals one beginning year 2001, and so forth. According to the model, how many fish in Skipper's Pond at the beginning of the sixth year, 2006? So as you can see, a lot of wording here, and this is just a classic, just like, blah, a lot of words in your face, but really it can be simplified into further. And so this is really where this kind of breakdown comes in place. You just want to think of what are they trying to ask? So according to the model, how many fish were in Skipper's Pond beginning year 2006? So really just, if I'm going to break it down, be how many fish in 2006? I'm sorry, 06 in that case. And so this will really be breaking down simply. So what information did they give us? Well, here they say F, the number of fish is F, and they give you an equation, F3 to the power of 2 to the X, and the X is a year since 2006. So in this case, I know that X is going to be equal to 6. Where, and then the equation of f of x equals 3 to the 2 to the power of x, where f of x is going to be the number of fish. Perfect. So let's do the math and just plug it in. So 3, we're going to plug it in. Really, you can write f is, you don't have to write all this down. You can just use a calculator and plug in 6 right away. But just to show the format of it, or just formality, so f of 6, so that's 3 times 2 to the power of 6, right? And then 2 to the power of 6 is use a calculator, or you can just do two times two times two times two times two is 64. So there's 64 times three, really, three times 64, and that's gonna get you 192. And all of these, I would just use a calculator and push it through. That sounds about right, right? If I had one, it'd be six, and I'm doubling it every year, so it's just six, 12, and so on and so forth. It's only six years, so perfect. And you move on. Sweet, we're almost there. Question eight, Manish drove from Chicago to Baton Rouge at 8 a.m. He was 510 kilometers from Baton Rouge. At 1 p.m., he was 105 kilometers from Baton Rouge. Which of the following close, is closest to Manisha's average in speed and kilometers per hour from 8 a.m. to 1 a.m.? So really, what are they trying to ask is break it down. What is this kilometers per hour? And they give you from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Right? And what information they give you? Well, he was 510 kilometers from Baton Rouge at 8 and then you're the 105 away from 1 p.m. So we have to think about the time now. So time-wise, 8, 8 a.m. Excuse me, to 1 p.m. would be five hours. And then 510 kilometers, then to 105 kilometers away. Notice it's away. Just keep that nine. There's a difference of it. So it's 510 minus 105, which is going to get us 405. Right, and we're taking kilometers per hour. Sorry, kilometers per hour. That's going to get us the kilometers 405 divided by five. And that's going to get us 81 kilometers per hour. And that makes sense to me because if you're going 400 kilometers in five hours, that's not exactly 100, but 
not close to 100, so it would probably be near 80. And so just checking that off. And you can also take a quick glance at your work, see if you made a mathematical error sometimes. Sometimes that happens. And so it's, it's always something to be aware of. Question nine. In the figure shown below, E and G line on the segment AC, D and F lie on AB, D, E, and F, G are all parallel to BC. And the given lengths are feet. What is the length of AC and feet? So I don't need to show the entire geometric proof, but basically we're looking for what is this length, right? And you're given all these different values that you have. But in this case, anytime you see kind of these parallel line things, the mental shortcut you can kind of think, especially when you see triangles like this, is similar triangles. So you know that they are proportional to each other. So in that case, you're just thinking, hey, this thing's proportional, right? If I'm going to draw these out, this ADE is going to be proportional to the big triangle ABC, right? And so we can set that up. Um, if you want to set up the proportion, I'm going to set this, this AD to the AE, so the short to the long side. So I have 8 over 16. And then what is AC? The long side would be this total here. So that's 8 plus 7 plus 6. So 8 plus 7 plus 6. And so that's going to get me 21 over question mark. And then clearly, you can cross multiply by, see that this is double. So I'm just going to multiply by 2. And that's going to give me a length of 42. And we move on. And that kind of makes sense. Like you can see 8, 16, so then I know it's going to be double on that long side. And it's 21. Just quickly check the math. You do a calculator if you need to. And move on. All right, last question of this video, question 10. I hope this has been helpful. Um, states Katrina runs at 50 miles, 50 miles in two and a half hours. What is the average number of minutes? Notice that they have italicized for these things. Um, every single time they have italicis, that means it's important. They're not trying to trick you. The main thing in ACT is just trying to be here to test your knowledge in a standardized way. And so the big thing is italicized, not minutes, whatever they're saying. saying. It takes you to run one mile. Okay, so really they're saying what is the miles per minute or how long does it take her to run a mile um, in minutes. So basically you need to find miles per hour and then convert that into minutes. So do so, let's do the miles per hour first. So miles per hour, you just take the miles and divide by the number of hours So 15 divided by two and a half. Use a calculator, this is 2.5, right? And what you should get, six so you have six miles per hour so now that's the number of <clears throat> miles per in an, <clears throat> in an hour excuse me and so the way you can think about this then is that how long does it take you to run one mile so if you run six miles per hour how many minutes is that right that's be 60 minutes so you run six miles in 60 minutes and so you can see it really works out nicely. That means you just look at this would be just from looking at it, it would be one mile in 10 minutes. Right. However, if this wasn't the case, you can always find miles per minute um, and just take six divided by 60 and get one tenth of a mile per minute. And then you want to get to one mile, so you multiply that by 10. So. 10 minutes but either way that's what you have and that's the answer and we are done for this video i hope that was helpful I'm going one through ten using the same method that i have um if you have any questions please leave them in the comment below i hope that was clear enough that all the questions could be ceased to be answered but if there's anything i know sometimes there's some things that pop up I'm more than happy to answer it just drop it below and if this system doesn't make any sense because you didn't see the last video please check that out and for now i hope that you take care keep on grinding Good luck on the ACT and hope to see you in the next one. See ya.